Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first Free Press Book Club session of 2022. Oh, it feels, still feels weird to say 2022. I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm still writing the wrong date on my calendar all the time. But um, welcome and thanks for joining us. Um, we'll do a quick round of introductions. Of course, we have Ben Sigurdsson, the literary editor from the Free Press, and Chris Hall, co-owner of McNally Robinson. And of course, our author, Wabgishu Grice. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, as always, we're going to start with a land acknowledgement. So Ben, Chris, and myself are all joining the call from Winnipeg tonight, which is Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territory of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. And Wab is joining us from uh, Sudbury area of Ontario. Yeah, and Sudbury is also known as Nswakamuk, and it's the traditional territory of Atikamek, Shing, and Anishinaabe. And it's part of the Robinson Huron Treaty signed in 1850. And of course, that's a treaty that predates Canadian Confederation. Thank you for that. Um, we will go on as usual. Um, we will uh, get Chris to do his introduction and then Wab's gonna do a reading. And then we'll move into the Q&A and a lot of you submitted questions. So um, feel free to keep submitting questions in the live chat, but we may not make it because we have a lot of pre-submitted questions. Uh, so with that, I will throw it over to Chris. Great, thanks Aaron. So it's common knowledge when you're, if you're planning to take a flight and you needed to choose a book to read, you would not choose a book that's centered on a plane crash. So as I read Wabgisha Rice's novel, Moon of the Crusted Snow in the middle of a pandemic and the temperature outside my window played around minus 40 with the wind chill, I couldn't help having my thoughts turn to my own store of canned goods and noticed a slight internal celebration every time the lights came on with a flick of the switch. But that analogy of the plane crash plot stayed with me. But no worries, I'm gonna be fine. And as bleak and challenging as the storyline to this novel is, it, like all great books, offers so much more and makes it worth spending time in such a world. Chilling in the, most, in the best possible way offers Eden Robinson on the cover. Plus, I was sitting in the warmth of an armchair the whole time, so what kind of challenge was I taking on anyway? The novel, in many ways, is about power. The loss of power to light and heat homes and travel for more supplies is, of course, the main one. But it is also about the power of the chief and other community leaders to keep things calm and organized. The power of the white culture of the South, which reappears in the person of Justin Scott. And maybe the power or powerlessness of individual humans to face the elements without the help of all the conveniences we now take for granted. On the other hand, maybe the empowerment of those individuals when forced to face the elements and rediscover old ways used by people who didn't have access to the kind of help we do. So I found the novel quite thought provoking so many ways and we'll explore some of that in our conversation with the author. But before we get to that, I will hand the power over to Wabkisha Grice to read from his novel. Great, miigwech. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thanks, Aaron, for hosting. And uh, Ben, looking forward to chatting with you. Uh, just to say quickly, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure uh, to be a part of this book club. And it's really special for me to make a connection with Winnipeg again. As some of you know, I lived there from 2006 to 2010, working for CBC. And I always visit fondly. Winnipeg is a really special place to me. Uh, it was my home for a while and uh, it's just great to have this connection still. So Chimiguech, thank you all for uh, having me tonight. And I'm really looking forward to uh, the conversation and to all your questions. Uh, so I'll just read a really quick passage from Moon of the Crested Snow. Um, I'll read chapter 11, which is only a few pages long. Uh, this uh, takes place about a week after the blackout happens. Uh, it's Evan and Nicole at home. Those are the two sort of protagonists. Um, and Nicole has uh, a bit of a foreshadowing dream. So this is uh, Evan and Nicole at home sort of um, re, I guess, centering themselves with each other and figuring out what the heck is going on. Hey, wake up. Nicole nudged Evan again. He opened his eyes in the pitch black bedroom. He couldn't tell if he was awake or still sleeping. Evan, wake up. Her elbow in his side stirred him out of his deep sleep, but it was the tremble in her voice and her rigid body that really woke him. I'm awake, what's up? I had a really weird dream. Oh yeah? Yeah, I'm scared. He turned to face Nicole and inched closer. Come here, he said. She buried her face into his t-shirt. What was your dream? I dreamt that me and the kids were outside, she said. 
and we were trying to run through the snow. But it was that kind of snow that's hard on top and real powdery underneath. Nongos was on one side and Mayangan was on the other. I was holding their hands real tight. I was trying to run on top of the snow, but I kept falling through every couple steps. The kids would pull me back up and we'd start running again until I fell back through. I don't know what we were running from or running to, but we had to get somewhere. You weren't around anywhere. The kids kept saying stuff like, don't worry, mommy, and we're going to make it. But it wasn't their same voices. It was like they were elders speaking to me. They were calm. They were smiling at me every time they pulled me up from the snow. I was getting tired and they made sure I made it out of there. I was falling deeper and deeper into the snow every time the crust broke. Then I finally fell in over my head. I was struggling trying to get up. The snow was getting in my eyes and in my mouth. I thought I was going to suffocate. But they reached all the way down to pull me back up. This time, their hands felt bigger. Evan lay perfectly still, listening. He stroked the top of Nicole's head, soothing her while he grew increasingly frightened. She sniffled and he knew she was on the verge of crying. They pulled me all the way to the surface up to my feet, but we weren't running anymore. We were in the middle of the bush and there was a whole bunch of other people there. There was a fire going. It looked like a winter camping set. I turned back to face Mayangan and Nangos, but I saw a young man and a young woman wearing old patched snowmobile suits. They both had long hair that flowed so beautifully. They smiled at me, and then I knew it was them. It was our kids, but they were adults, all grown up. They started talking to me in the old language, but I didn't understand them. It was a place I didn't recognize. I didn't recognize anyone else there either. I was panicking. Then Nangos reached out to grab my hand. She squeezed it tight and looked into my eyes. Her eyes were so big and brown. Her cheeks were so high and proud. Her hair fell so beautifully down the sides of her face. She was the strongest and prettiest young woman. Then she reached up and touched my cheek. She said, welcome home, mommy. And then I woke up. Miigwech, thank you. That's a little bit of Moon of the Crescent Snow. <laughs> Thanks very much for, uh, for, for delving into that, Wub. Um, I do want to come back to the, the dreams in the book because I, I feel like they're, they're pretty significant and, 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 and quite evocative. Um, but maybe before we do, can you talk a little bit about the, the process of, of, of writing Moon of the Crested Snow, like when you started and sort of, you know, the, maybe some of the, the, the speed bumps that you encountered or, or you know, the ways that the, the story changed is just between sort of conception to what we have in our hands now? Yeah, it was a very long process, a long journey. And I guess it probably really started back in the summer of 2003. Uh, some of you may have heard of the big blackout that happened uh, in the eastern part of the continent. Um, I was living in Toronto at the time, working as a, mostly as a freelance journalist. Uh, but that day the blackout happened, I was back home in my community in Wasoxing, which is about a two hour drive north of Toronto. Um, and I was with my brothers. We were house sitting for uh, our dad and stepmom who were away on summer holidays. And, um, you know, that was it's a really long story and I won't tell the whole thing. But being in my home community at the time of crisis uh, was was really comforting for me because I knew that even though all the power was out and, you know, resources potentially could dwindle, like my brothers and I thought like that was the end. You know, <laughs> we were like going into survival mode. Right. Um, but we knew that there were resourceful people around us in our community, you know, there were people who knew how to live on the land and people who, you know, could fish and hunt and gather medicine from the bush and all that. And uh, I felt really safe there during that moment. Um, so the power came back on the next day and life eventually returned to normal. And I went back to the city and learned about some of the slightly more chaotic things that were happening there. And I thought, if this ever happens again, I'm definitely leaving Toronto and going back to the res. Like, there's no way I'm sticking around here, right? Um, so that really, like, stuck with me for a long, long time. And I thought, you know, I'd like to write about something like that someday. You know, I, I was always a fan of sort of post-apocalyptic and dystopian literature. Um, and a few years after that, I read The Road by Cormac McCarthy, uh, which I really enjoyed. Um, you know, many of you have probably read it and know, are familiar with the story. Uh, it's very grim. It's very dark. Uh, but I really liked, you know, just going deep into that sort of darkness of the dystopian realm. Um, but what I saw in that was a pretty opposite experience than my own when faced with a uh, world ending, potentially world ending crisis, right? Like in the road, it's the dad and the son just trying to survive. But when we had the blackout on the res, we're like, you know, let's try to get people together, you know? And I thought in a lot of those kinds of books I read growing up, I didn't really see a lot of 
community building or a lot of discussion about how to make a good future. It was just survival for a couple of people, you know? So I thought, you know, if there's an Indigenous way to tell this kind of story, I want to do that. Um, so again, like it, that was like in the late 2000s, 2008, 2009, maybe. And, and again, the, the idea just sat with me. And then finally, I decided I wanted to try to write it in about 2014, 2015. So um, I was working at CBC in Ottawa full time then. Uh, and, you know, basically just pounding out words, you know, in my spare time, you know, uh, after work or on the weekends or whatever else. So that was the biggest challenge was trying to carve out time to write while working as a daily journalist, right? A general assignment uh, TV reporter in Ottawa. Um, fortunately, you know, a couple of times in that writing window from about 2015 to, um, you know, early 2018, when we, you know, put the final draft to bed, I took a couple of leaves uh, supported by grants from the Canada Council for the Arts and the Ontario Arts Council. So I was able to take like two months at a time each just to get that draft done, just get the manuscript done. So um, it ended up being a fairly smooth process, uh, all things considered. And um, yeah, you know, I, I was saying before we went live here that uh, the book was published in 2018 and, and it's been out for, you know, almost three and a half years now. And I still have, you know, opportunities like this and readers still letting me know that they enjoy the story. And I'm just, I'm just so grateful, you know, I'm so honored and, and I'm humbled at the same time by the response to the story. And like the book changed my life, you know, and this is my full-time job now. So, you know, that's uh, in a nutshell, the, the, the grand journey I've had with this story. Well, it's amazing. And yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, obviously, a lot of the themes um, resonating more so now, maybe than ever, uh, particularly for, you know, for the, those of look, well, we're all in the throes of the pandemic, obviously, but uh, you were saying that sort of you, there's been a slight uptick in sales and interest in the book and stuff like that. Um, what is it like sort of being in the midst of all of this uh, and sort of revisiting this book now sort of with a couple couple of years of a, a real life, you know, not not necessarily dystopian or post-apocalyptic, but, you know, teetering on the brink sometimes uh, <laughs> sort of real real life. Oh, it's weird. Uh, like, no doubt about it. Um, I think the weirdest part for me was while I was writing it and living that in my head constantly, you know, as Chris mentioned earlier, like when the power goes out or when you start running out of food, like in those moments while I was writing the first draft, that's when I got scared the most, right? Um, but I resolved that by writing the story out and, you know, putting it out there into bed, right? And when the pandemic started, like that's when, you know, the book got a little bit more attention. And, um, you know, people started seeing the parallels, like with the panic buying, the empty shelves. Um, I think what the biggest draw was, though, at that point, you know, in early to mid 2020 was the mystery around the potential end of this. Like we still, we're not there yet, obviously, but we have a clear idea of how it's going to end. Um, we didn't at all back then. And I think that's what, you know, really freaked people out about, you know, a post-apocalyptic or dystopian story like Moon of the Crested Snow. But what I believe, my theory is like people uh, ate up stories like this because there's a resolution in each kind of story like this, right? You know, the end of the world crisis ends and something happens. There's a future after that. So maybe people took comfort in that. Like, that's what I think anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, thank you to all your readers who read it as a result of the pandemic, because, you know, the royalties let me quit my day job, you know, so. <laughs> well, you know, you talk, people talk about doom scrolling. Maybe people are doom reading too. Yeah, right? yeah. Chris, Chris, maybe you can answer this, this well, question. Yeah. Uh, play as, little, as a little side question. Is, has there been an uptick in, you know, sort of uh, dystopian, uh, post-apocalyptic pandemic related uh, novels or, 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 or nonfiction, I guess, for that matter? Possibly. I hadn't thought about that, but um, like Station Eleven, for example, uh, yeah. Netflix jumped all over and, uh, and uh, I, got my copy right here. <laughs> I, I would say uh, I can say that people are reading more. So mm -hmm. people clearly want to get out of, uh, of their daily uh, tasks and uh, <laughs> um, uh, be somewhere else uh, briefly. And uh, <laughs> books are such a great way to do that. So, yeah, we can certainly say that. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on this. No, not spot, at all. I, on you. But I, I would further uh, your point about, uh, or I'd maybe uh, challenge Wob a little bit that 
the ending um it's like the great endings uh um and they lived happily ever after that's not actually an ending if you think of it it's actually a new beginning yeah and so 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 is the end of your book there's it's a new beginning and and so maybe there's a lesson for us in this pandemic yeah. it's not there's no end it's about continuing yeah well and we okay. can we can we can uh sort of get some little sneak peeks maybe later on near the near closer to the end of the uh our chat or whatever about the uh, sequel I, I know you're working on. <laughs> so, um, but it, it, I did want to sort of come back to the the, the dream uh, component uh, and the dreams sort of throughout this book, which I I find very evocative and just so uh, you know often so foreboding and so ominous. You've got uh, we had a reader ask about you know Dan's dream uh, about the fire, and then Nicole and Evan both sort of have their dreams about you know snow related dreams. Um, uh, well, I just want to make sure that I, I cover off this reader question too. Um, when you're writing the novel, um, uh, right, the uh, Dan says, uh, we may as well be going back in time. And so the, the, the reader asks, uh, when you're writing the novel, was that his intention or was that your intention or point of the story that things were, were better than and that progress was not really made? Um. A little, uh, but not necessarily. I think like modern indigenous life uh, is rife with contradictions, you know, um, not like in, entirely out of our control most of the time. You know, we have to, we're forced to reconcile this past that was taken away from us with, you know, the future that outsiders want us to create for ourselves, you know? Uh, so it, it's hard to figure out how to do that, like on a community level, on a personal level, for your own family and so on, right? So often, yes, you have to look to the past for answers to figure out what you're going to do in the future, but that past has been stolen from a lot of people, right? Which is really tragic, you know? So um, yeah, I guess in some ways, it's, what I really wanted to do was illustrate just the complexities of, of Indigenous life, you know, and I think those nuances of, you know, what one person's reality can be from another person's within the same community, you know, um, and I think what was really important for me, especially with a story like this, was to be able to contextualize those things, you know, contextualize that history and show the humanity of everyday Indigenous people in a First Nation, because I don't believe we get enough of that in mainstream media and mainstream arts and so on, you know. Um, I, I was very fortunate and very privileged to work as a journalist for a long time, you know, I had great opportunities to talk to everyday Indigenous people about their truths and their realities. And I had the honor of conveying those realities to audiences across the country. You know, that was really important and I didn't take that for granted at all. Yet I found I was always confined by those formats and, and you know, uh, within broadcasting, especially, you only have so much time to get someone's story across. So weirdly, I find in fiction that I can contextualize those things more effectively because there are no limits, really. You know, I can spend as much time as I want showing what Evan's family dynamic is or talking about, you know, the intimate relationship Evan and Nicole have with each other. You know, how romance can flourish in a First Nation because a lot of people don't necessarily consider those things if their only frame of reference of a First Nation is what they get through the media, right? Or what those little shreds that they've historically gotten from the mainstream arts, you know? Um, yeah. So I think that's my intention there, yeah, with looking in all those different directions. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I mean, um, you know, you talk about sort of the, the the past that has been has been stolen, and 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 you know, there's the the you know the and the land and the and the where where you know, these communities lived that was also stolen and, and, you know, pushed on to, you know, you know, for lack of a better term, like less desirable or, or worse, um, you know, areas of, of the country or whatever. Yet in this book, you know, when people need to uh, survive, they flee, you know, the big city and they come back to, you know, these places where, you know, there is safety and not only because of isolation, but also because of this feeling of community. Mm -hmm. um, if that makes any sense. And I did want to add, sort of talk about the, like the importance of community to me in this, in this book is so important. I mean, you know, from, you know, the sharing of, of what, what has been, you know, hunted and brought back to the community, to the sharing of the, um, the reserve uh, storages of food and, and, and what have you, and, and just how that is sort of 
um, for, for a lot of the characters, just the default position versus, you know, the world we live in, which is, you know, go to Costco, stock up, you know, as, as quickly as possible. And, and that's almost reflected too in the, in the Northern store that's up there, that's owned by the big grocery store chain. Right. And when people go there, it's not, it's not community building. It's, you know, like grab as much stuff as you can and get the hell out of there as quickly as possible. So I thought you did a great job of sort of uh, portraying that that contrast and those th that tension sort of between those those two those two worlds. Thanks, appreciate that. That's not a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I could turn it into a question that uh, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, our booksellers. Uh, I was chatting with booksellers today because we were talking about the book, and and um, uh, one of us uh, um, fastened on Cam as a character and how he is an example of someone who doesn't thrive, doesn't thrive before this story, hasn't thrived through this story, falls under the sway of, of Scott. Um, and he, he literally ends up kind of as a tragic figure with blood on his hands, quite literally. And I wondered what, what did, um, like, what was it like writing about Cam? And did, were, you, were you purposely giving him a role that, that, uh, that allowed you to say a few things or? Uh, yeah, you know, again, one of the things I wanted to convey was was those dynamics, those family dynamics and, and the differences um, within a family in terms of the connection to the land and, and tradition and so on, right? Like can be, it can be fractured within just one family, you know? Uh, I experienced that within my own family and, and I've seen that within my own community and so on, right? Um, but it also illustrates, I think, as time goes on, the younger generation potentially being further disconnected from the land as a result of reliance on technology and modern infrastructure and so on, right? So yeah, I sort of wanted to show how within a family like that, that disconnect can really happen. Um, but yeah, he's a tragic figure. Um, like, uh, it's important, you know, to know that we shouldn't blame Cam for any of that. Like, I don't blame him for that. Like, I hold a lot of love and, and respect for him as a character. Um, and, and he's just, you know, an example of his circumstances, right? Like this, this community that is very much in transition, you know, it was displaced from its original homeland down on the Great Lakes to far Northern Ontario. Um, and people adapted easily enough at first by, you know, falling back on their land-based knowledge. But as, you know, it, it got connected to the hydro grid and it was disconnected from its diesel generators and then it got internet and cable TV and so on. Like that's how rapidly that happens, you know? And I've seen that rapidly happen within my own community and with my, within my own family, right? And that has happened to me personally, you know? I grew up in my community um, in a house with no hydro running water hauling water, uh, pulling in a fishing nets, um, you know, going hunting with my dad, gathering medicine in the bush and so on. That was my upbringing until I was like eight or nine years old. And then we got hydro and we got TV and everything. And then 10 years later, I left the reserve to move to the city, you know, and I've been an urban person for 23, almost 24 years now, you know, um, I still go back. I have a place in my community, but I don't live there full time. So I don't live I don't embody that existence that I once did, you know, and that, that's just how quickly that, you know, it, it's assimilation in some ways, but um, I want to be careful by, by saying that too, like um, it's necessity in other ways too, right? Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to show how, again, you know, the contradictions that we embody, we can embody, not everybody does. Mm -hmm. And yet have sympathy, as you say, yeah. that, that final figure of Cam just in despair really is, uh, was quite to, uh... Yeah, it's quite impactful. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Um, trying to want to make sure that I get to some of these reader questions. Um, right. So uh, one of the one of the readers asked about the uh, you know Nanabush stories, which often which appear frequently in Indigenous writings, and um, and 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 this this reader says there seems to be an infinite number of Nanabush stories. Is your story about Nanabush and the geese part of? you know, uh, indigenous culture, or was this uh, particular particular story an original story that you had you had sort of created? Oh, good question. No, that's a story I heard when I was a kid. And uh, it's pretty widespread. Um, it's not that particular story. There are different versions amongst different indigenous nations. I know that there is a there's a Machif version of that as well. Um, and I think that's just a result of how stories sort of um, traveled throughout the land, um, you know, historically. Uh, so yeah, that, I heard that story a lot when I was growing up and it was one of my favorite ones. And I think like 
when I was writing this, uh, you know, I was thinking back to some of those morals that I learned through those stories that I heard as a kid. And I wanted to see if one would potentially fit in this story. Um, yeah, so that's where I squeeze that in. And yeah, it, in many ways, it's an homage to our storytelling tradition. Um, but it's also like a way to convey those morals that were imparted upon us as kids, you know, because, you know, traditionally, that was our form of entertainment, you know, that's not just how we learn about our culture and history and language and so on. Um, it's how, you know, the adults kept the kid, kids occupied for a long, long time. Right. So, so yeah, that's, so, it, that's not an original story by me. It's a story mm -hmm. of the people. Um, and it's a story of many people's. Mm -hmm. Well, and I thought the character of Eileen was just an incredible sort of connection to the past um, and just resonated so, so much while I was reading this. Um, and uh, I was just rereading a couple portions, you know, earlier this evening. And uh, she talks uh, to Evan about how the world is an ending that it already ended with the arrival of, and you're going to have to forgive my mispronunciation. Maybe you could just pronounce it. Uh, pronounce oh, the Jagannash. Jagannash. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the origins of that and the mentality relative to sort of what everyone else in the book is, is feeling? Yeah, that, that part uh, is based on a conversation I had with my own grandmother uh, many years ago. Um, I think when I was in my late teens or in my early 20s. Um, and I don't know, I don't remember what prompted that conversation, but I was sitting with her in her house and we got talking about family history because um, she was always really proud to share, you know, her grandparents' stories with, with us kids. Uh, and, and one day she told me about how her grandparents' generation were really the ones who witnessed the end of their world. So where I'm from, my community is on an island. Uh, and traditionally, our ancestors traversed the North Shore of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay um, since time immemorial, as they say, right? Uh, but after Canada was confederated and the Department of Indian Affairs interpreted the Robinson-Huron Treaty, which, as I said, predated confederation, uh, it interpreted it to say that my ancestors, uh, where they originally resided, which is now Perry Sound, Ontario, had to go out to this island, which, which they called Perry Island, right? So that was my great, great grandparents' generation. Um, and she told me that she heard stories from them about being forced out in this island and then looking back over to the mainland where all the trees were raised down because forestry became the primary industry in Perry Sound, right? So they were confined to this island that they couldn't leave uh, under the uh, laws of the Indian Act. Um, and they watched their traditional home essentially be destroyed, be chopped right down. Uh, and she said that was the end of their world, you know, and everything after has been essentially dystopia, you know, she didn't use that word, but you know, that's me paraphrasing. Uh, and that was a really profound moment for me. I thought, wow, like that, that really drove home what an indigenous existence can be um, after being colonized, right? After being displaced and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was an important message, an important lesson for me that I wanted to help convey to readers. And that's not an original idea either. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of other indigenous authors of post-apocalyptic fiction have brought this up all the time. Um, but that, yeah, again, it's just, just a lesson I learned from my grandmother that I wanted to write about. So Jagannash, if, again, apologies if I did that wrong. <laughs> what, it, like, what is that, that, that word sort of, what, how would we understand it in, in English, I guess? Yeah, well, the, in, in the Shinobemwen, in Ojibwe, there are two words for white people or for okay. you know, settlers. So Jagannash is uh, the British, like the English speaking settlers. And Wemtegoshi is the French speaking settlers. So um, in that part of the land, you know, we dealt primarily with, with the Jagannashuk, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the British, British ones. Mm -hmm. and, and in terms of, um, in ter of like, how did you find the process of writing, um, you know, of, of sort of writing dialogue uh, sometimes completely in English and sometimes in, in a mixture of, of two languages. Like, was that something, um, does that, that I, pro I would imagine that would come naturally to you just from hearing, you know, people in your community where, where you grew up or whatever, sort of, sort of jumping back and forth like that. Um, but what was it like to write it, I guess? Oh, it was, uh, it was fun. It was really challenging. Um, that's, that's a roadblock, you know, that now that you bring it up, um, that I internally faced. I'm not a fluent speaker at all. I probably have the comprehension and skills of maybe a three or four year old. Um, I grew up with the language around me all the time. So, you know, I hear it, I understand it uh, very well. I know how um, 
you know, it's, it's evoked. Uh, I know all the inflections and so on. So, you know, hearing it and then trying to put it on the page was a little bit difficult because I was always thinking about non Nishnabi readers or non indigenous readers. And I really got caught up with that. And what I ended up doing initially was basically translating every single little chunk that I had written, you know, so every little statement or every little word um, I would have the character say it again in English, you know, and, and that still ex that still exists in, in the final version, mm -hmm. some some instances of that. But I give full credit to my editor, Susan Renouf, uh, who said, you don't have to do that, you know, like, be proud of your language, write it for yourself and write it for your community. Don't worry about how everybody else is going to perceive it, because there are effective ways to write out of those statements so that the reader knows what's going on, you know, yeah. you can just say, what they said in Ojibwe and then have them enact what they just said, essentially, you know? Yeah. Or I think there's also, I think there's also in the book, there's, um, you know, instances where it's just inferred, like you sort of, you just, you, you can sort of just infer what they're talking, uh, what they're talking about, because it is the dialogue is so like, for me, I, I'm, I'm a sucker for dialogue. I love dialogue. And, uh, and I think you just did a great job with it. Like the, the conversational nature of so many, so many of the interactions was just so natural. And I, I felt like reading uh, those, those passages that sort of switch between English and Ojibwe, like seamless, like, and, and, and to, to, to a point where like, I didn't, I, I never really sort of had to stop and go, okay, well, what does that mean? It was like, it was always either inferred or it was uh, Im implied, or it just was sort of, you know, very, um, Ex explain sort of in a way that didn't sort of like hit you over the head sort of like oh this is what I you know exactly you know what I mean mm. oh thanks yeah I appreciate that yeah and and you know I, I felt empowered to do that but because of that process um which was very uh obviously very worthwhile but you know very heartwarming at the same time to know that I was encouraged to, to keep that up right mm -hmm. I, I like moments in in books like that I, I think as readers we we can be very greedy we we think we are owed uh, everything. Um, you've got to tell us everything. And I like those moments sometimes when it comes along and you, you're reminded that you don't get to know everything. You, uh, you're some of these things that's going on, you don't understand and it's okay. You don't have to, um, you can infer, you can, you can carry on with the story. So, yeah, so I, yeah I, I think it's, it can be very effective uh, to use it uh, in lots of different ways. I think. I agree. Uh, um, totally. And that sort of ties into this question that we have from, from a reader, who um, was wondering about, um, you know, uh, whether it was your intent to, uh, that the story sort of be developed in the form of an allegory almost, you know, um, that, that, did that sort of play in your mind as you were, as you were writing it? Yeah, entirely. Uh, that, that was pretty much uh, a big motivating factor was to try to create some sort of allegory for ongoing colonialism. You know, um, a lot of people would, you know, try to imply that we live in a post-colonial world because the settlers came over, you know, hundreds of years ago. But the impacts of displacement and then assimilation and, and essentially genocide, as we all know, uh, linger today, right? So with this community, although it has been displaced uh, and is in transition and is trying to learn, you know, how to exist with all these different sort of conflicting tools they're getting, um, they, they are essentially vulnerable to, uh, I guess, the will of the outside ruling order that still rules over them, you know? So Justin Scott believes that, you know, it's a reserve, so it must be a weak place uh, right for me to take over. You know, I can escape the madness of the city and go and take over this reserve. Um, so he's very much, yeah, an allegory for that, uh, that mentality of sort of exploitation and, and greed, essentially, and um, yeah, manipulation at the same time, too. So yeah, that was, uh, that was very much intentional. And, and you named him Scott intentionally? I was yeah, wondering about that, that too. <laughs> that, that was entirely arbitrary, you know? How I was, was like, it? I was like, what am I going to name this guy? You know, and I just, I was like, what's, what's a, a white guy's name? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, Justin Scott, I guess. But I, I did this uh, school visit in Regina and uh, the kids asked me, uh, you know, is it a, an amalgam of Justin Trudeau and Duncan Campbell Scott? <laughs> and I was like, no, that's, 
<laughs> very well That's done. Loaded. That's great. And it's funny because I was I was still working at CBC at the time. So there's no way that I could have like admitted that if it was true because I was in <laughs> trouble. Right? But uh, yeah, so it's, it's just, it's, again, it was totally arbitrary. But uh, yeah, the responses to that are pretty um, entertaining sometimes. I thought just on the level of character, you did that so well. Um, Scott comes in and he just assumes authority and he just like he just exudes everything like arrogance and power, like like the kind of physical power, but also gunfire and and so on. And and so he you manage to to make it emblematic, as you're saying, but also in the in the form of a what you <laughs> is quite easily imagined as a real person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, I, I put a lot of a, a lot of energy into creating him. Um, you know, as much love as I had for Evan and Nicole and their family, I, I, I loathed Justin Scott equally. And that was sort of the energy I wanted to put into him, you know, um, in order to, I guess, hopefully have the reader respond to him in the same way. Mm. Yeah. Um... I'm trying to, I just want to make sure that we uh, get to as many reader questions as we can here. Um, someone said numerous themes have been addressed in the story and that's a major accomplishment. I appreciated the linking of language and identity throughout the novel. Uh, it's an aspect that is not well understood in society generally. Thank you for your very thought provoking book. Not a question again, but figured I would get, put that out there uh, before I forgot. But we did have a couple of questions about the ending or potential endings or different endings and uh, ways different ways that it could have went um one person said if you're comfortable answer, addressing this question could you comment on the decision to conclude the story by having everyone leave the reservation and and but i i mean maybe you don't want to talk too much about this because i have a feeling that it has something to do with what you're working on now <laughs> um but also there another person said um did you ever contemplate any different endings for example auntie eileen teaches nicole about medicinal plants necessary for survival uh the reader could foresee this as a possible way to uh you know um uh, for scott to meet a different demise than mm. uh, than, than 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 turned out in the book <laughs> that's cool Wow, yeah. <laughs> I wish I thought of that. <laughs> uh, um, no, I didn't. I didn't think of any alternate endings. Um, I thought of the ending first. You know, when I decided that this is a story I wanted to create, it was always going to be that they overpowered and overcame this, uh, you know, terrible invader, and then were able to start anew. And I think the motivation behind leaving the established community is, I guess, the trauma that's attached to it. And, you know, they don't leave there until two years after the end, two years after they do away with, uh, with Scott. Um, it's mentioned in the epilogue. Uh, but they, I think at that point, have the skills enough to do that, to, to sort of recreate another settlement in the bush. Um, so, yeah, part of that is is renewal, as Chris was saying earlier, uh, of, of creating a new beginning. Um, but when I wrote that, I was like, I was satisfied enough with that ending to the story, the universe, the characters entirely. Like, I was done with it. I thought, okay, you know, I, I accomplished this idea I had, and I'm happy with it. I'm, I'm cool with just letting it go. But when I started to do like the circuit, um, you know, going to Winnipeg to, to the store, to McNally Robinson, doing those events and, you know, getting questions from readers and so on. Uh, everyone always asked me if I was going to write a sequel. And initially I said no, because I, I didn't intend to at all. Uh, I was done with the story. But then I started feeling really bad because every time I said no, I could just see the disappointment on people's faces, right? And I was like, oh, geez, you know, they pe people want more, you know, and, and they, you know, spent their time and their money with my story. And perhaps I owe them that if, if enough people want it, right? And, which is like the, the greatest honor and the greatest privilege, if you think about it, like people are uh, engaged enough with your story and it resonates enough with them that they want more of it. So part of your responsibility as a storyteller, I believe, is to, to do that, to 
explore that for them. And, and so as, as the months went on, I, I, even though I didn't have a solid idea for a sequel, I would just, oh yeah, I'm thinking about it, you know, <laughs> um, didn't really take it seriously at all. Uh, but in the summer of 2019, uh, my agent, I didn't have an agent when I started this, this book, but after it came out, I, I partnered with Denise Bukowski. Um, she said to me, you know, like, you should really start seriously thinking about a sequel because uh, I might be able to find you a deal for it. So she said, just just, just think of a, a basic premise. And, and I started thinking about it. And I thought, you know, what I want to see is how long they last in their new settlement in the bush. Uh, but also, I want to see what's happened to the rest of the world. And I want to know if they're able to reconnect with their original homeland from where they're originally displaced. Um, so that's the whole uh, premise of the second book. They le what they find is this this land that they've you know now inhabited for so long is, is starting to be depleted of its resources because they've been stationary for too long, and they realize that traditionally as Nishnabeg they would travel and you know not use up all the resources in one place. They would go from place to place, right? So ten years later, you know they realize it's time to go, and they decide, well, let's let's go south, you know, um, and. Within that 10 year uh, window, there were a couple of failed attempts. You know, it's not like this is their first time, um, but they finally have like, I guess the motivation and the need to move on. So uh, they send an expedition of six people south and then uh, you'll follow them on their journey and see what they discover. That's amazing. Uh, and so often when, you know, you talk to, talk to an author about, you know, oh, so what are you working on now? What do you got coming up next? You know, they're, they're always very like, you know, keeping it, keeping it close to their chest sort of in their, in their, in their pocket or whatever. I'm like, well, I don't really want to talk about it. Like <laughs> I've talked to, I've talked to authors before. They're like, oh, you know, I started this novel. It's, I got 200 pages into it and I put it on my side table and never looked at it again. Um, and, uh, and I always want to read those things. Uh, yeah. So that's really, but I, I think people will be thrilled to, uh, to know that uh, there is the next chapter coming. And I, I, you know, because the uh, apocalyptic or whatever nature of what happens in Moon of the Crested Snow is still so unknown, even just like, you know, to, to be able to get like some sort of a, a taste as to what happened elsewhere and stuff, I think it would be, we'll, we'll have people just clamoring back to it for sure. Um, and, and to see what, what the characters can sort of learn about the world and adapting and about themselves too in their in their journey so um we did have someone ask when the sequel might be coming out uh spring of next year uh okay. yeah yeah through through random house um they originally wanted to uh do it this fall but uh they wanted to give the marketing department time to catch up after the pandemic uh because there's a whole backlog like and their their catalog is still a little bit out of sorts so mm -hmm. uh they asked if we wanted to push it to the spring instead and my editor and i said yeah sure because it'll give us more time to to refine it right mm -hmm. um so we can take it a little bit easier now uh because originally if they wanted it by this fall like we'd be going to copy editing probably by March, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and there's no way at this point that that story is going to be ready for copy editing by March, especially cause like this month, you know, my, we had a family wide COVID infection and I lost a couple of weeks of work there. So it's nice to have a little bit of extra time just to really make sure that, you know, I, I do these characters justice and the next part of their story is uh, told properly. So um, yeah, spring, I think they're looking at May, May of 2023. Nice. Well, that's well, well, this, this book ends in spring, so it has to start in spring. Yeah, it? yeah, and and it'll mostly take place in the spring and the summer, so mm -hmm. it won't be another winter sort of, uh, um, you know, deep, deep, dark sort of dive. Into that, was, that was another thing about reading this book at this time is that as I speak right now, the wind is howling, the snow <laughs> is is blowing in like mad, and it's like Absolutely. it's we've had like a, no way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it's it's hard to believe, but but it's just been like such a a, a, a monumental amount of snow and and bone chilling cold that we've had this year. It just feels like it's it's maybe it's because it's you know we're into a pandemic, we're all at home, all that kind of stuff. But it just if I felt like I could like as the snow was falling in the book, I was just I would look out the window and I'd just be like, oh my god, I'm gonna have to go shovel that <laughs> crap again. <laughs> but um, I was I didn't find to... myself been uh, not taking the power and the heat for granted. 
Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. No, I was. I, I often thought of that as well too. Um, uh, I did have something else. Oh, I did want to. Um, I know we're sort of getting close to wrapping. Can I hop in uh, with something from the chat before we move on. Yes, and maybe you could. There was one question about cannibalism that I didn't get to from a reader. If you, I don't know if you have the reader questions there. Uh, if, and if you guys need to go longer, I'm I'm fine. You know, the kids are in bed, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> mine aren't. <laughs> So we have Enid in the chat said you painted a really accurate picture of life on the res. Um, I appreciate that, which is a nice comment. Um, and then I had one person email me this afternoon and one person in the chat, um, both asking about the title, um, how you chose the title, the significance of the title. So if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. Yeah, happy, happy to. Uh, my wife, bless her heart and soul, who just put the kids to bed because I'm here with you all. Uh, she encouraged me to give it that title. And what happened was we're sitting, you know, on this couch when it was in Ottawa, when we lived there. Um, and I had this little dictionary of Wasoxing dialect uh, Ojibwe, right? Um, which I referred to a lot when I was uh, write, writing the uh, Nishnab Emo in that dialogue. Um, so I was going through, the, there's a part um, shortly after that moment where Evan's with Aileen and she talks about surviving the end of the world and so on. He goes and does his rounds and he's thinking about what time of year it is because he can't really put his finger on it because calendars are obsolete now, right? Um, so he's trying to remember his teachings, uh, you know, and what the months are called in Ojibwe. And he's going through it in his mind and he's like, oh yeah, you know, maybe this is the, the, the moon of the crest, crest of snow, Um, So I, I was looking, I was like, oh yeah, how do they, they translate it in my community exactly? So I look in this, because um, it's often called Crested Snow Moon in, in other translations, right? So I look in this little book and it said, Onaben e Gizis. Um, I think it says something like the moon of the hard crested snow. And I said it out loud to Sarah and she's like, oh, there's your title right there. And I was like, oh yeah, maybe it is. <laughs> maybe that's the title. And I just sort of obviously changed it a little bit to moon of the crested snow, but uh, yeah, that's where the title came from. Well, and it fits in too with the uh, with Sarah's dream too of continuously falling through the snow and being pulled up by by her children and stuff. I thought that was just a, a sort of a brilliant connection that worked so well. And it's a yeah, it's a lovely title as well, just on its own. Um, and yes, and I, we did have a, one of the questions I didn't get to from readers. Um, you know, um, mentions uh, they were slightly disappointed about the theme of cannibalism and that the it sort of distracted from the thematic richness of the novel and wanted to sort of know sort of, you know, your rationale for including the theme. I, I get, I sort of get that it's sort of, you know, dystopian post-apocalyptic and, you know, these kind of, these kind of things, you know. So yeah. You got to do what you got to do, I guess. I don't, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully I never know that for sure, but. Yeah. Well, it, I, it, in, in addition to being an allegory for colonialism, uh, Moon of the Crest of Snow is also a Wendigo story. So a Wendigo in our culture, um, it, a, a figure prevalent in Nishinaabe and Meshkego Cree uh, stories, is a monster that thrives mostly in the wintertime. <clears throat> and what it does is it exploits a community at its weakest. Um, it'll come in uh, and eat people. Uh, it'll turn people against each other. Um, basically, it thrives on evil and it wants to take control. It wants to uh, basically propagate itself. It wants to multiply. So Justin Scott very much is a Wendigo, right? And when, it, we were, yeah. <laughs> when we were kids, uh, we would hear Wendigo stories. And the original objective of a Wendigo story from our community's perspective was to deter people from eating each other. So when we were kids, you know, the elders would say, don't eat people or else you'll turn into a Wendigo. Um, and of course, that was never going to be a possibility for us, right? But that's, that's why those stories existed. So uh, when I was writing it and I got to that point, uh, I, I texted my dad and I was like, holy geez, dad, like, I, I think this is like a Wendigo story. And I told him, we talked on the phone we, and he, I told him a little more about it. And he's like, yeah, that's just because you have the Wendigo stories in you. You heard these stories growing up and it just came out of you. Um, whether you realize it or not, right? So that's where the origin of the cannibalism is, is to um, give reference to and also acknowledge the Wendigo stories of my culture. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. that, that's a, a perfect explanation and uh, makes a lot of sense. And and yeah, the, you, you, Justin Scott embodies that in, in spades, I would say. Well, he's a monster, right? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> Uh, and so I, I, I took it that as that, that he, he yeah, he, um, that's how, that's his idea of, uh, 
of progress. <laughs> totally. Um, well, uh, are there, I don't unless there are any other questions that came in in the chat or anything. Anything else you well, wanted I, to? I, sorry, I, bring I wanted to ask. Uh, there's a bit of a writing uh, question I have. We're again back to booksellers talking about your book today. Um, we were struck by how. Um, there's some there's some pretty dramatic moments obviously in places and i'm thinking about the um like when scott shoots the newcomer and and mm -hmm. then there's the brawl and the lineup um for food and and then even the shooting of scott at the end um they're highly dramatic points but you play them very succinctly you, you don't like you'd be so easy to pick up a book that overplayed those um <laughs> to a fault and yet you if anything underplay them and it, and it ends up these kinds of scenes kind of go by very quickly. And I was wondering what, um, um, like, is that a process of editing for effect or, or was that what your natural inclination was? Well, how, what was the process of, of uh, that, That's an awesome question and I'm glad you brought it up because uh, very much was a process of editing. Um, I think for me, as I continue to learn how to write literature, like this is not something I was trained to do. I didn't go to school for, you know, a creative writing degree or anything like that. Um, I very much learned to write fiction just by reading, you know. Um, I'm a journalist by trade, right? I went to university for uh, broadcast journalism. So I think when I tried to start writing fiction, um, what I thought was, you know, fiction, was really heavily expository, you know? Um, and it ended up being these really long, very descriptive sort of explanations of, of moments, you know? And the original draft of Moon of the Crested Snow was about 75,000 words. And the final product is barely 60,000. So mm -hmm. Susan and I cut a lot. It, but what she really helped open my eyes to was the benefits of being a journalist and writing in that way and how that could benefit my fiction. And she said, you know, you've been trained to write these very direct sort of punchy active sentences. Um, you're writing a thriller. So use more of that, you know, let's pare back some of the descriptions and it may not necessarily have been always those action scenes that she mentioned. Um, but throughout she said, you know, just, uh, yeah, like you pare back those things and, and make them stronger. And like you hear the debate around show, don't tell in, in fiction, right? Or in literature. Um, I think my personal view is that, you know, you have to strike a good balance between the two. And I think Susan really helped me do that. Um, but, you know, it, in some ways too, it's more fun to write those kinds of sequences in really direct, direct ways, because I think they can be, uh, more impactful too when they just happen in a quick moment you know so mm -hmm. yeah that was very much a result of um susan's advice and guidance and uh yeah i think i'm a better fiction writer as a result of that process for sure that's it so fascinating sorry struck me as more sorry it struck me as more realistic because yeah, those probably. moments would kind of fly by they happen like it's over before you know it and then you try to figure out what happened whereas yeah. the other way of doing it you know you it's almost like turning it into slow motion that yeah uh, yeah yes and that's the, i imagine that comes from the journalist background in you i mean uh, the, the total opposite side of the coin is that i did a like i did a master's degree in english in creative writing and now i work at a newspaper and i have had like i spent the first many years uh, here like just you know like cutting and hacking and slashing because it was just like well, the stuff I was doing was just too descriptive and so I feel like I I sort of or maybe our paths sort of crossed on the way or whatever <laughs> because I'm not trained for for this either and you're not trained for what you're doing and you're doing a great job so I would hope to Thanks, be, likewise, be, ben, yeah. be able to emulate a fraction of that so uh, I'm not trained either yeah well there you go are, are any of us oh I'm trying. Aaron, Aaron, <laughs> right, fine, fine. Uh, anyway, I, before Aaron jumps in, I do want to say uh, thank you so much, Rob, for for joining us. It's a real oh, pleasure, sure. and I love this book. I, I read it through a couple times over the last couple months. One of the benefits of sort of having an extra extra little bit of time off between book club meetings or whatever is that, and and because it's uh, such a yeah such a taut you know uh, yeah just a, a propulsive book is that. Uh, yeah, I, I was able to revisit it on on more than one occasion and just jump in and jump out and uh, and reconnect with those characters the second time I read it uh, as much or more so than I did the first time. So 
uh, congratulations. It's, it's yeah. great. And I can't wait to read the sequel. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I agree. I can't, say, can't yeah. wait for spring 2023. <laughs> yeah. Well, th thank you all. It's great to chat with you, Ben, Chris, and Aaron. Like, uh, again, thanks to the Free Press for organizing this. And it's just super uh, special for me to be able to reconnect with uh, people in Winnipeg again. You know, this is a great chat. Um, I'm very thankful and honored to have an opportunity like this to talk about my book. So thank you. And yeah. I hope you'll come back for the sequel and hang out with us again. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And in person, hopefully this time, hopefully, right? Like, yes. We'll have all this behind us, you know? So yeah. mm -hmm. um, just before we call it for the night, um, our next book, The Stranger, mm -hmm. Catherine of Vermette. I'm so excited. Um, Katharina was our very first book club author back in May of 2020. We had such a great chat with her about the break. And this book is sort of a companion novel to The Break about the Stranger family. Um, so we're very excited to have her back uh, next month. And then on Friday, you'll all be getting an email about our picks for March, April, and May so that you can get ahead of the curve. We're very organized this year. I'm very impressed with us. Speak um, for yourself. <laughs> okay, well, I'm very excited this year. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're really excited to uh, let you all know what's coming up for spring. We have some really, really amazing books uh, lined up for you. Um, and that's that's it for us. I hope everyone stays warm and safe as we're expecting a blizzard in Winnipeg tonight. Um, Wob, thank you again so much for your time. Such a pleasure to have you. Um, and yeah, we'll see you all again next month. Bye. <laughs>